I felt like I experienced every verse in the chapter, in the experience that we're going to discover in Jacob, is exactly what I felt in a certain point in my life. And you're going to see how Jacob's experience is an experience for anyone who is like called into a deeper calling, when God is calling somebody to, to a deeper and more intimate like life with him. So we're going to read Genesis chapter 31. Verses 1 to 42. Genesis, Genesis 31. 1. Actually, you know what? We'll just read the whole chapter. All right. Now Jacob heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's, and from what was our father's he has acquired all this wealth. And Jacob saw the countenance of Laban, and indeed it was not favorable toward him as before. And the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field to his flock and said to them, I see your father's countenance, that it is not favorable toward me as before, but the God of my father has been with me. And you know that with all my might I have served your father, yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not allow him to hurt me. If, if, he had said, if he said thus, the speckled shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore speckled. And if he said thus, the streaked shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore streaked. So God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. And it happened at the time when the flocks conceived that I lifted my eyes and saw in a dream. And behold, the rams which leaped upon the flocks were streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. And the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift your eyes now and see. All the rams which leap on the flocks are streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land, and return to the land of your family. Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Is there still any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we, not considering, are we not considered strangers by him? For he has sold us and also completely consumed our money. For all these riches which God has taken from our fathers are really, are really ours and our children's. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do it. Then Jacob rose and set his sons and his wives on camels. And he carried away all his livestock and all his possessions which he had gained. His acquired livestock which he had gained in Padan Aram to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the household idols that were her father's. And Jacob stole away, unknown to Laban the Syrian, in that he did not tell him that he intended to flee. So he fled with all that he had. He arose and crossed the river and headed toward the mountains of Gilead. And Laban was told on the third day that Jacob had fled. Then he took his, brothers, his brethren with him and pursued him for seven days' journey, and he overtook him in the mountains of Gilead. But God had come to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night and said to him, Be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. So Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mountains and Laban with his brethren pitched in the mountains of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, What have you done that you have stolen away unknown to me and carried away my daughters like captives taken with the sword? Why did you flee away secretly and steal away from me and not tell me? For I might have sent you away with joy and songs, with timbrel and harp. And you did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Now you have done foolishly in so doing. It is in my power to do, to, you, to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, Be careful that you speak to Jacob, neither good nor bad. And now you have surely gone because you greatly long for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? And then Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid, for I said, Perhaps you would take your daughters from me by force. With whoever you find your gods, do not let him live. In the presence of our brethren, identify what I have of yours and take it with you. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. And Laban went into Jacob's tent, into Leah's tent, and into the two maids' tents. But he did not find them. Then he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the household idols, put them in the camel's saddle, and sat on them. And Laban searched all about the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, 
Let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise before you, for the manner of women is with me. And, the, and he searched but did not find the household idols. Then Jacob was angry and rebuked Laban. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, What is my trespass? What is my sin that you have so hotly pursued me? Although you have searched all my things, what part of your household things have you found? Set it here before my brethren and your brethren, that they may judge between us both. In these twenty years I have been with you, your your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried their young, and I have not eaten the rams of your flock. That which was torn by beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it. You required it from my hand, and whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was in the day the drought consumed me, and the frost by night and my sleep departed from my eyes. Thus I have been in your house twenty years. I served you fourteen years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages ten times. Unless the God of father, of my father, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac, had been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction in the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. All right. How many of you know how a mother eagle trains its young to fly? What happens is, the baby eagles are in a nest. The nest is warm. The nest is familiar. The nest is comfortable. The nest stays there until its wings become big enough and strong enough and it becomes, the eagle is strong enough until it is ready to go. But of course, the young eagles don't know that they can fly. And so they just sit there. They get bigger and stronger, but they're comfortable. They don't want to leave. It's nice. It's pleasant. They just stay there. So what does the mother do? When the mother can discern that the younger eagles are strong enough, it starts shaking the nest. It starts messing up the nest so that the eagles would just fly out. And eventually they fly because they have to fly. Because what good is an eagle if an eagle doesn't learn how to fly? So the mother will shake up the nest, kind of push the eagles out, and when they fall out, they learn to fly. And if they aren't ready to fly, what happens? The mother eagle will swoop under the eagles and catch them so that they don't fall completely if they're not ready. This is exactly what is happening to Jacob. I'll give you kind of a summary of what's happening. We know Jacob left his father's house. He deceived Esau, took his birthright, deceived the father, stole the blessing. Mom said, get out of here. Esau wants to kill you. He leaves, goes, lives with his uncle Aban. Laban. On the way to his uncle, he sees the ladder. God confirms his love to him and says, I love you. I'm going to be with you. At a time when Jacob was afraid, because we talked about how Jacob is a mama's boy. He's very close to mom. He doesn't know how to live outside of mom's home. That like everything was unfamiliar. So he was scared. So God appeared to him and sent him a ladder, pulled him out of the pit, said, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to take care of you. Then what happens? He goes on to Laban. He finds Laban's two daughters. Rachel, Leah, marries them both, one by mistake, other one willingly, and then ends up um, making a deal with the father saying, hey, you know, like, give me some sheep or whatever. And he ends up giving him Laban, or sorry, Jacob ends up doing something to get the sheep, and this is where we're at. So Jacob, God has blessed Jacob and made him rich. He has a lot of sheep. And now this is the part that you're going to see. This is the real like calling to a divine life for Jacob, a consecrated life. This is what's going to make Jacob like a, a flying eagle. How is it relative? God, all of a sudden, Jacob was comfortable in his uncle's house, right? He's working. He's familiar. We said he's afraid to be by himself because his mom, all he knows is his mom. He's afraid to be by himself. Ends up like depending on his uncle, he gets the sheep, gets money, gets wives. It's familiar, it's safe, it's comfortable. This is fine. Jacob began to accept this life, not realizing that God had called him to uh, uh, promises with lands and blessing, and I'm going to be with you. God said, no, I can't have you stay here at Laban's house anymore. I need to shake things up. The same thing is exactly with us. There comes a time in your life where God is going to shake things up and force you to leave what is comfortable. 
Jacob at this point was forced to leave. And you're going to see how. We always all cling to something. If you think about maybe the first time you had to move away, the first time things weren't working out in the circumstances that you were in, maybe you applied to a local university, you didn't get into the local university. You wanted jobs close to home, you didn't get the job close to home. You wanted a certain type of service, you didn't get the service that you want. God allows these things to happen. He shakes up our life to say, it's not easy for you, but it's the best for you. Because I'm going to build you up in this next stage of life. I need to get you out of the nest. Just like the, the mother eagle shakes up the nest, gets the little kid eagles outside, and then the eagles learn how to fly. What are you clinging to now in your life? How is God, or how has God stirred up the nest that you are in, that you are comfortable with, that you are familiar with, and God is saying, you can't stay here anymore. Often we, we say, like, I always come across young people, they live with their parents, they're reaching a certain age, and it's time where, like, it's time to grow up. And they say, if it's not broken, don't fix it. I like it here, it's safe, it works, it's comfortable, I have mom's cooking, mom cleans my clothes, mom does all these things, it's nice. I recently came across a, a young man who graduated from college, living at home. Mom said, look son, I love you, but you're too old to be living at home. And he says, mom, what are you saying? He said, she said, you have to leave. Mom, are you kicking me out of my house? Yes, son, it's best for you. But mom, like, what are you doing? What did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong. It's time for you to get off your bottom, go out there, get a job, experience the real world. It's time to go. Often, God does the same thing to us. A lot of us say, I'm happy to where I am. I know God wants to build me up, make me strong, give me new experiences. No, thank you. I like the way I am with God in this way. I go to church, I hear some Bible studies, I pray, I have a safe spiritual life. God says, no, I want to go in a deeper relationship with you. So what does he do? He kicks us out of the nest. God will kick you out of a nest like a mother eagle will kick out its child in order that the eagle will learn how to fly. That's why Jacob's home was getting broken up. We see in Genesis 31, verse 3, it says, Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. Why wouldn't Jacob want to go back to his family? How come Jacob would be scared that God says, Go back to your family? Because he knows very well that Esau, his brother, wants to kill him. He's deceived his father. Like, things aren't going to be right. I'm already here at Laban. I'm getting rich. I'm getting lots of flocks. Everything's working out. I got my two wives. I have tons of kids. Everything is perfect. But God is saying you're getting way too comfortable. And there was a danger that Jacob was experiencing. Sometimes Jacob's or God is telling us you are in danger of forgetting the promise, the promises that I gave you. You know, see, God promised to Jacob that I'm going to give you land here at Bethel, which is where he saw the, the ladder. He's saying, I'm going to give you lands and I'm going to give you descendants as the seashore. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And he began to forget those promises that God wanted something great of Jacob. And Jacob said, I'm happy at Laban's house. I'm comfortable in the life that I'm in. God is stirring up the nest and he's saying, get out. Get out, get out, get out. You can't stay here anymore. If you're going to be the man who is going to have the blessings of my promises, you can't stay in this circumstance. He was getting used to that life. He forgot that he was a pilgrim. You know, Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were used to living the tent life. The tent life was, I'm free in the hands of God. They would move from place to place. They would build altars. They would build altars for God, permanent foundations of worship for God, but they lived in tents. 
Jacob started to get settled with his uncle Laban. Laban represents the world. Laban represents everything that the world has to offer to a believer. To a believer. The world tells you, you're good enough like this. Your spiritual life is good enough. Don't rock the boat. Keep things the way they are. Everything is nice this way. He lost that spirit of being a pilgrim. And he started to consider himself a citizen of Laban's land. And that wasn't his land. That wasn't the land that God promised him. God promised him a different land. And that land that he promised him was called Bethel. And if you know it in Arabic, Arabic is Beit Il. Maybe you can translate it. The house of God. Okay? The house of God. So God was calling him back and saying, Jacob, go back to the place that I have promised you, the place where I dwell. The place where you are going to experience a deeper revelation of my love. You'll notice that Jacob, as he was living with Laban, he was learning to become more crafty, more deceptive. He was learning new bad things. And God said, you have to flee from here. You have to get away from your uncle. We're going to get into what that means. There's also risk of... So we see that Laban, his uncle, had foreign gods in his house. Okay, He had foreign gods in the house. Jacob was at risk that Rachel and Leah would corrupt his children with the worship of these idols. So another thing is he's saying, if you're going to stay in Laban's house, your children are at risk at being corrupted. You have to leave the world. I wonder how many households have heard the call of God to go to the house of God. Let your dwelling be the house of God. Let your home be the house of God. If you are living in the world, your kids will become corrupt by the gods of this world. As much as we tamper with the things of the world, you have to know that we will be corrupted by the things of the world. We tamper, we play, we test, and we say, I promise I'll be different. I'll be special. I won't let this lifestyle get to me. I won't let these movies affect my way of thinking. I won't let, let this type of fashion affect my heart. I won't let everything that we see in this world affect me. And God is saying, Jacob, get out of here because that's where you're going to become corrupted. The first thing was a call to depart. He heard God's voice. We don't know how he spoke to Jacob. Often you hear God's voice and you're not sure if it's God's voice or not. How can you know if God is calling you and telling you to leave the position that you're in? Maybe it's a position at your job. Maybe it is a place that you live. Maybe it is a vocation. Maybe it's a service. Maybe it's a calling that you have and God may say, Pick up and go. How do you know it's from God? Because often, sometimes, people like to play whatever's easiest or whatever is more comfortable than God is blessing. You're going to see exactly how Jacob could discern it. If you're not sure that you're hearing God's voice, the fathers of the church say this statement. I want you to remember this statement. Whenever you're trying to make a decision, when in doubt... Don't. When you are in doubt whether you should move, don't move. When in doubt, don't. Don't move. That is very, very, very important. Sometimes we doubt and we just jump. No. God began to close the doors for Jacob. And that's how he understood. The first thing is that he said, Laban's face or his countenance was changed towards me. Number one. Number two, he changed... My wages 10 times. Every time I began to get successful, if he said I would get the spotted calves and they would come, he'd say, no, now you have to get the striped calves or sheep. And then after that, he said, you have to get the gray ones and God would keep on changing. Every time Laban would tell him, you can have these types of sheep or goats, God would give it to him. So Laban would change his circumstances. 
He was assisted with his outward circumstances. He removed the comforts of a place for him, for him to realize it's no longer the place for him. Often, sometimes, the place that you are in, that you are too comfortable in, God will shake it up. Things aren't going as well at work. The market changed. I remember when I was called to, to consecration, when I was younger, before I was a priest, I was called to consecration to be a missionary. Things were going great. I was making good money. I was serving God at church. I was doing things great. I had my wife. I had my kid. Everything was nice. Overnight, the market changed and my, my whole industry was destroyed. I was in the mortgage and banking industry. It was destroyed. I began to realize things aren't as easy. Things aren't as comfortable. So I began to discern that God is pushing me out of my nest. He's saying, you can't stay here anymore. Because you were so comfortable, you were living in this place, I'm going to shake it up a little bit. And all of a sudden, things began to change. God will remove the comforts of a place for you to realize that it's no longer the place for you. He wanted to lead him into the deep. Which is why Peter, when he was fishing, fisherman, great fisherman, knows what he's doing, an expert fisherman, one day goes out fishing, couldn't catch anything last night. What's going on? I couldn't, I went fishing and he said, I couldn't catch anything. Christ says, go out into the deep. Jesus, look, I'm the fisherman. You're the teacher. Let me stay the fisherman. The shallow area is where you find the fish. He says, no, go out into the deep. The day God created for Peter, this lack of comfort, you know, he was a fisherman. He realized for the first time, I'm not supposed to be a fisherman. I'm supposed to be following God, which is why when he went with Christ, he got a whole lot of fish. Then he said, depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. And then Christ told him, now you will be a fisher of men. God will create things to be unbearable for you to realize that life will only be, comfort will only be in him. He doesn't want us to settle. If you are settling in your spiritual life, God is going to shake things up. Be ready. If you are at a point where you're like, I'm not growing, I'm not committing more, I'm not experiencing God, out of God's love, He's going to begin to shake things up. You say, I'm going through all these problems now, I'm getting depressed, I'm lonely, I'm this, I'm that. All these things are going on in my life. God is saying, I'm creating these for you, for you to wake up. I'm pushing you out of the comfort that you're living in. Now listen to this. I want you to know when you make the decision to go to God's call, Jacob was going to obey God, even though it was a very scary thing for him to do because he was comfortable. I want you to see all the things that were fighting Jacob. Because when you are called to go deeper in the life with God, you're going to see several steps in which he was, in which he was tempted. Verse 14 and 15, you'll see, in the beginning, Jacob didn't want to bring it up to his wives. He didn't want to bring it up to his wives. How are they going to leave their father? How are they going to leave their brothers and the lands and the flocks and everything that they've had to go with Jacob in the land of discomfort? So he was kind of afraid. What did God do for that? He changed the heart of Rachel and Leah. Verse 14 and 15. And then Rachel and Leah answered and said to Jacob, to him, Is there still any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not considered strangers by him? Talking about their own father. For he has sold us and also completely consumed our money. For all these riches which God has taken from our father are really ours and our children's. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do it. Though Jacob naturally would have been afraid to leave the comfort that he was in, and then he was looking to his wives, most men who are called to consecration, most men who are called to become missionaries, to become priests, to become something deeper, the thing that they're afraid to do is tell their wife, is to tell their wives. The way you know that God is making the way is when He changes the heart of the wife. Is when He changes the heart of the wife. He began to change the hearts of those around him. Ask any priest, I would say eight out of ten 
Wives will say, please don't. Let's not do this. What about our kids? What about our lifestyle? What about our money? What about our time? What about this? What about that? God will change the heart of, of the spouse at a certain point when he wants you. And what he was afraid of, God was already moving the, the, the stumbling blocks out of his way. First thing was his fear of telling the, those closest to him. Verse 23, what happened? So Jacob Khalas is ready to go, he's ready to leave, to go into this new life with God. Verse 23, then he took his brethren with him and pursued him for seven days. Let's read from 22. And Laban was told on the third day that Jacob had fled. So Laban took his brethren with him and pursued him for seven days journey and he overtook him in the mountains of Gilead. The first thing the devil will do is he's going to pursue you. When you are ready to make a decision to give him it all, the devil's going to run after you. It's not going to be easy. He's going to pursue you and look at what he's going to do. Verse 27, what does he tell? What does Laban tell Jacob? Laban is the uncle telling Jacob, Why did you flee away secretly and steal away from me? And not tell me, for I might have sent you away with joy and songs, with timbrel and harp. So what is it that Laban is telling Jacob? He's trying to create doubt. You think I was going to hurt you? No. I was going to do nice things for you. Maybe we were going to celebrate. Maybe I would have like encouraged you. So he began to create doubt in Jacob's heart. Really? Was he going to do this for me? Why am I running away from Laban? He's such a nice guy. Look at the trick of the devil because he knows that once you enter into the call, and the, the consecrated life with God, that's it. You're going to fly like an eagle. You're going to fly like an eagle. First thing is, he pursued him. Second thing, he created doubt. Verse 28. And you did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Now you have done foolishly in so doing. What is he doing here? He's playing with his emotions. He's playing with Jacob's emotions. You didn't even let me say goodbye to my lovely daughters. Jacob's starting to feel bad. What kind of person am I? What's going on? And I remember when I was leaving to, to Africa, and I always tell them, my parents were like, thought I was crazy. They said, we left Egypt to bring you to America. Right? You're leaving America to go live in Africa. It doesn't make sense. Right? It doesn't make sense to go do this. And they began to say, you're going to take our only grandchild with you? Oh my gosh. Like... Like if it wasn't a knife in my heart thinking like you're taking our grandson from us. So if it's not about us, at least like, come on, the poor grandparents want to see the kid. Plays with the emotions. The devil will play with your emotions. Verse 29. If that doesn't work, it is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night saying, be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. You see, Laban was going to threaten Jacob. First, you don't like, let me say goodbye to my daughters. Then, he was going to threaten him. So God intervenes and says, don't you dare say something dangerous to Jacob. Don't you dare try to scare Jacob, because I'm going to keep him. I remember when we made the move to Africa, it was kind of like no, nobody from the West had ever moved to the mission in Africa. It was kind of like a... No one knows what's going to happen. And I was offered the priesthood in, in one of the areas. And I began to think, okay, what if it doesn't work out in Africa? Can I come back? And one of the, one of the bishops in the area said, if you go there, you get ordained, don't think that you're coming back here. So he was threatening me, saying, if you go to this place, don't you dare think that you're going to get, you know, be consecrated or be, and I'm going to come here and support you when you're tired and you want to come live in this nice, luxurious place. So I began to feel the threats. I had to make a decision. Either I'm going to go, leap of faith and say, I don't know what's going to happen to me. I don't know if the country's going to break out into civil war, which it was at the time, and it was very scary. I don't know what's going to happen. He threatens us. Verse 3, 30. And now you have surely gone because you greatly long for your father's house but why did you steal my gods? The next thing that he's going to do is going to mock you and make you feel like 
you're a thief. You're not doing anything. Yeah, you're stealing my gods. He began to make him question himself. And this is where you're going to see that Jacob, how he responded. We have to make sure that our camp, our home, our life is clear from all the household gods. Jacob had no idea that Rachel stole the household gods and brought them with him. As far as Jacob knew, he was clear. When he saw that his father and his uncle, his father-in-law, was responding to him in this way, he said, he began to rebuke him. Jacob began to rebuke him harshly. You'll see that in verse 36. Then Jacob was angry and rebuked Laban. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, What is my trespass? What is my sin that you have so hotly pursued me? Although you have searched all my things, what part of your household things have you found? Set it here before my brethren and your brethren that they may judge between us both. He said, Look, I know I'm honest. You can't touch me. I am leaving. And we're going to make a covenant to show that you are very clear. You know that I didn't steal any of your gods. What are you going to see here? They end up making a heap of stones. This is important here. Verse 40. Um, verse 45. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. Then Jacob said to his brethren, Gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. And they ate there on the heap. Laban called it Jagar Sahadutha, but Jacob called it Galid. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, its name was Galid, also Mizpah. The key word Mizpah, Mizpah means the Lord is watching. Okay? And then what does he say? Because he said, May the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent one from another. If you afflict my daughters or if you take other wives beside my daughters, although no man is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. Then Laban said to Jacob, Here is the heap, and here is the pillar which I have placed between you and me. This heap is a witness, and this pillar is a witness, that I will not pass beyond this heap to you, and you will not pass beyond this heap and this pillar to me for harm. What is all this heap of stones and pillars and all that stuff? Jacob made a sign with Laban, with his family, with the people that are with him, and God, and said, I will never cross back to the world. I will never go back to the other side. I am going now on my journey, even though it's scary. I don't know what I'm going to see. That's it. I made a covenant. I made a witness that I will never cross these stones. Those stones are the cross in which we crucify the world. There's going to be a time when you consecrate your heart, your life, your mind, your body, everything to God, you need to build up an altar and you need to crucify your old life. You need to build up a witness to all and saying, I'm a believer, I am God's, and I'm only going to do what He wants. And that's exactly what He did. He built a witness. You have to break away from the life of worldliness. God shaked up Jacob's nest like an eagle shakes up the nest of its children because it needs to fly. It needs to fly. He wanted Jacob to grow and to go deeper. The last thing is the divine care that we see that Jacob experienced. God's care for him. Verse 42, it says, Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. What happened is that God told Laban, don't you dare threaten Jacob. He's mine. And he began to rebuke Jacob's enemy. First thing, and he began to realize that God is with me. God will never send you alone. 32 verse 1. So Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. Don't ever think that when you make the decision to give God everything, you will be accompanied by angels. You will be surrounded by the angels of God. This is the message that God is trying to say. It's not just, it's scary, how are you going to leave the comfort of your own home? No, you will be accompanied by angels and I will not leave you, I will be with you. 
29, like we said, he came to Laban and rebuked him. God rebuked him. Was Jacob worthy for all of this? Did Jacob deserve any of these things? I always tell you in every Bible study about Jacob, Jacob is the worst guy in the world. Jacob makes the worst choices. He is deceitful. He is trickery. He's full of trickery. He's crafty. He's cunning. But God loves him. And God is going to do everything to call you. And you might think, this call is for Jacob, not for me. Maybe Jacob is a saint. No, Jacob was a bad guy. Jacob made bad decisions. Jacob made poor choices. But God said, I love you too much. I love you. I want you to be an eagle. I want you to understand that you are supposed to be full of glory like an eagle. So he's going to shake up your nest. Maybe your nest is being shaken up right now. Verse 38, last point. He thought he was the perfect shepherd. These 20 years I have been with you, your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried their young, and I have not eaten the rams of your flock. That which was torn by beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it. He was saying, I was a perfect shepherd. What he began to realize in this time was that God was the perfect shepherd. God is the one that took care of every detail of his life. God today is calling you and he's going to shake up your nest. He's going to push you out of the comfort of your nest, out of his love to call you into a deep, holy, consecrated life of following him and experiencing the glory of God. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God, Amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, each and every one of us, Lord, gets to this point where Jacob is comfortable. He's forgotten that he's a citizen of another land a city without borders, a city with no foundations or whose foundations are in heaven. Help us to remember, O Lord, that you are calling us, Lord, to experience the heavenly life, that deep, intimate experience of you, Lord. Lord, we come here before you and asking you, Lord, in the times where you're going to shake up our nests and move us, Lord, into that life of, 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 of blessedness in which you're trying to grow us, Lord. Give us faith in you. Show us, Lord, that you are caring for us and that you are accompanying us with angels. Give us, Lord, the ability to discern your voice, to know, Lord, that you are doing things because you're calling us away to the place where you promised us abundant blessing, which is a life fully devoted to you, Lord. Give us the ability, Lord, to build up an altar and to crucify the world as a witness to the whole world, to those that we love, and be able to say, Lord, that we are 100% yours, no longer turning back to the Lord, to the world. I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't give in to the, the tricks of the enemy to deceive us, to play with our emotions, to create in us doubt, to threaten us, Lord. Give us the grace to fix our eyes upon you, the author and the finisher of our faith. We pray this in your holy and precious name, through the intercessions of St. Mary, St. Mark, and all your saints, with the blessings of this holy month of Kiyak. Make us worthy to pray thankful our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation. But deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Right now we're going to...